Hey everyone, welcome to another video. Now today I'm going to share with you my detailed Syndra guide. I haven't said this very often, but I just genuinely feel like Syndra at the moment in its current form is genuinely OP. I don't like using this term because it's thrown around a lot and it's a very loaded term, but I just haven't seen a champion that is genuinely blind pickable and can always find a way to be useful as long as the correct itemization choices are made, as long as the correct rune choices are made, and as long as the correct adjustments to the overall game pace are made within each game, you can just always find a way to be useful. And I just don't think that's healthy for the game, but it is just the current state of Syndra at the moment. And note guys, before we get into the nitty gritty, you need to understand that Syndra is is an insanely high skill cap champion. So yes, you may already be decent at Syndra, but there's always little ways to optimize your gameplay. And if you're up for a challenge and you want to add a champion into your pool that um, you know you want to play over a long period of time, Syndra might be a great choice for you. I just want to quickly cover a few quick points before we get into the guide specifically. But because Syndra is such an incredibly versatile champion and there are many, many ways to play her, I will be covering all the runes you can take. But for today, I will be highlighting specifically one way to play Syndra. And this is going to be the style that has been given me a lot of success currently at the moment, climbing in high elo challenger games. My OPGG is in the description below, and it's a much more scaling oriented approach. And remember guys, this is just my opinion. It works for me in my current elo in this current meta. Yes, there will be a lot of different ways that you can play this champion and you may see other players play it differently. But again, Syndra's optimal setup is very subjective and it will change from server to server or elo to elo. And the optimal setup will always evolve given the meta changes. So this is just my current take on it. Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind when watching the video. Now let's get into the runes, guys. So this is my favorite number one go-to Syndra page. Now, what I'll do is actually go through each row specifically and then at the end tie it together why I actually believe this is the, the best or the most optimal way in my eyes to play Syndra. Now, Phase Rush traditionally has been a very scaling rune, a very deep, people view it in a very defensive way. That is the case majority of the time. But what I realized with Syndra is that it's good for both offensive and defensive purposes. You can take really, really great short bursty trades with Phase Rush on Syndra. You can go do the Q E W or Q E auto attack trade, run away, and there's basically no counterplay. Um, and the great thing about this is that because it's a scaling rune and you can use it in the early the early portion of the game, it gives you so many options and it's just so flexible. Um, so I've found a lot of success with this rune specifically. And also because Syndra is such an immobile champion and really relies on her E for self peel, what this actually does, it allows her to use her E aggressively and still be safe. And not many other rune pages um, do that. Now, the next row here, for obvious reasons, you want to be going mana flow because Syndra is an incredibly mana intensive champion. Next row here, there's two options usually. There's absolute focus or transcendence. I have noticed very aggressive laners like Caps actually opt in for uh, absolute focus because they're, you know, they can be a bit psychotic in laning phase and just want to get the most poke off. The reason why Absolute Focus isn't too bad on Syndra comparatively to other champions is because she has such a strong early laning phase and because her range is nearly unparalleled, you're going to be reliably high HP um, in a lot of matchups that you just outrange. So you can get a lot of value from Absolute Focus. But again, the most consistent rune, in my opinion, is just Transcendence. That's what I personally opt for, opt in for. Now, this next row is incredibly interesting, and this is what personally leveled up my game completely. Now, I usually, in the past, if you've watched my previous videos, I'm a massive advocate for Scorch. Now, in the past, my initial, you know, my initial opinions on Syndra was that you're a very, you're a champion that can reliably proc Scorch, so Scorch must be good. Now, what I've realized after talking to one of my pro mid laner friends, he said to me, he said, Curtis, what the OP thing is about Syndra is that if you can actually still win lane with Gathering Storm, he just felt like that was really obnoxious. Now, a lot of other champions, on the other hand, that take Scorch, they need Scorch to get solo kills and increase the pace of the game and utilize and get that extra poke down. But the way I feel with Syndra, it's like, cool, you can take Scorch, and that is a preference if you want to play a lot more aggressive, a lot more fast-paced. But I've actually found a lot of success by taking Gathering Storm 
and using my early laning phase to scale incredibly nicely and don't I don't need to tunnel too hard on getting early solo kills and playing super aggressively, I can actually use my early lane strength to scale nicely with Gathering Storm. Now, I didn't believe, I actually didn't believe this person when they first told me, I just tried it. And for some reason, I starting, started winning a lot more games. And what this actually did for me was when the game got to around 25, 30 minutes specifically, the extra AP had just allowed me to have so much threat on the enemy AD carry that I could just one-shot people. And my threat was through the roof. Um, and I felt like I just didn't need Scorch. It was a bit unnecessary. And again, this is my take on it and the way I like to play, play Syndra. Um, but it is personal preference there, guys. Now, for secondary, you'll see a lot of the people like Zauhu, some of the best Syndras in the world, they will always opt in for Inspiration Secondary. The main reason, what I've actually realized, is that Cosmic Insight is very nice. Purely because with Phase Rush, 90% of the time you are going to be going GLP, because GLP is very, very nice on Syndra. So the active item CDR, uh, CDR in general, because you, your flash is very, very valuable on Syndra, and just CDR in general for all your abilities, um, because you have very high cooldown abilities as well with your E, um, your W as well. CDR is just very, very nice on Syndra. The other thing that, and the reason I don't highlight Time Warp Tonic is what I've realized is that Doran's ring is much nicer for me personally. The reason being is because I don't like playing the heavy trading, aggressive style of Syndra anymore. Why I think Syndra is so OP and the most reliable way to carry with Syndra is use your early lane strength to scale. So you go Cosmic Insight, you're going Phase Rush, you're going Transcendence, you're going Gathering Storm, you're going Magical Footwear if possible. Um, so what will happen in the early laning phase, because you just outrange everyone, you can just minimize the early lane, slowly win, take very calculated trades. Yes, you're not going to be solo killing people as much, but you're going to get to your key spikes much easier. What this actually will do, and because Doran's Ring is better in extended laning phases, you can actually reliably get to 1300 gold without even having to base. Yes, if you go back to base, it's completely fine, you can get a second Doran's, but I, I found just having Doran's is great because my laning phases were becoming very extended and I can stay in lane for 1300 gold which feels really really nice so the other options after cosmic insight are either magical footwear or biscuits if you want a little bit more sustain in lane and you're heavy trading or maybe a harder matchup you can go biscuits um, although I personally like magical footwear because again I'm going for this very scaling oriented approach so this is my go-to scaling oriented Syndra page and it may seem a little bit weird, but trust me, as I go through this guide and show you the gameplay, this is just what's been giving me a lot of success. And it sounds a bit weird, but it really, really works. Now, this is the other page. Generally, you want to be going this poke page with Comet in matchups where you want to punish her in a very good matchup. So maybe versus like a Cassiopeia, um, any of these low range or like mid range champions that are very squishy and you can reliably poke down. Sometimes even like Victor, Oriana. This is when you're going to be more playing for lane. You're not scaling as much. So I do recommend that you go down this trade and you go in for Scorch. So you're kind of all inning on the laning phase in a way. Because Comet doesn't scale barely at all compared to Phase Rush. And conversely, um, you can opt in for the Cosmic Insight Biscuits with Doran Start. But I feel like if you are going Comet, um, it does make a bit of sense to do go Time War Biscuits and play the lane quite fast. But again, if you're in a very easy matchup like Casio where they can't really trade back onto you, you might as well just go Cosmic Insight and Magical Footwear with Comet. So it's a bit of a 50-50. It's like scaling with your secondary, but um, all inning on the laning phase with, uh, with Scorch and Comet. Again, preference, whatever you like doing. But the premise is a lot more of a lane focused oriented way of playing it. Um, whereas Phase Rush, going back here, sorry, one second, just going back here, I find that this can it can work in basically any matchup. And a lot of the, the more tricky matchups where you're not going to be reliably able to get poke. Whereas this is the one where you just want to punish people and get pressure. Now, this third one. Now, this is the page I still take when I'm versing very low-range aggressive matchups. I'll get into this bit later on. But, you know, matchups like LeBlanc, where it's very low-range, heavy trading. And obviously, if you're going to be going Electrocute, Taste of Blood, Eyeball Collection into Ravenous, you definitely want to be going, in my opinion, Time Warp Tonic and Biscuits, because you're going to be heavy trading, playing very, very fast, probably early basing, getting early solo kills with Ignite, because generally, you pair this page with Ignite rather than the other ones you pair with, um, with Teleport. So, again, I'd take this all the time versus LeBlanc. 
I do see people do secondary sorcery with electrocute. This is, I'm just not a fan of this personally. It's, I mean, it's viable, obviously, but I just feel like if you're going electrocute, it just means you're going all in on the laning phase. You're going very, very aggressive. Most likely you're going to be heavy trading. So you might as well go Time Warp Tonic and Biscuits instead of this, you know, Mana Flow Transcendence, which is much more scaling oriented. Um, cause I'm a big advocate for all inning on a specific identity. Cause what actually happened, if you look at my OPGG and you filter it by Syndra games, I didn't have much success at all on Syndra in the past. And this is why I didn't play too much Syndra. I was like, eh, this champion feels average. But what I realized it wasn't the champion. It was the way I was playing it. I was playing it in a very 50, 50 way. I was like either all inning on the early game, trying to create chaos and play fast, fast, fast. Or, um, or doing a 50-50, like half scale, half aggressive. And it just didn't work for me. So when I went full scaling, the full scaling approach, or full early game when, when the matchup suited it, I just had a lot more success. So again, um, I do recommend ta uh, Time of Tonic Biscuits with Corrupting Pot Start if you are versing like, you know, uh, matchups like... You can even do it versus like Zed. You can do it versus LeBlanc. You can do it versus um, Silas. Very aggressive, uh, crazy matchups. Now, some people say that LS does go airy. I am not a fan of this page at all. The main reason, again, okay, yes, airy's nice with Poke, but I feel like its identity doesn't make sense with Cinder. It's like if you want to go for Q Poke trades, just go Comet. You're going to do, I feel like you're just going to do more damage. But yes, I guess Aerie has a shorter cooldown and you are, are going to be getting a lot more reliable poke with Aerie. But I just feel like in the matchups where you're going to be going Aerie, you might as well just go Electrocute and get more damage. Because the way I see it, right, is Comet is good if you can't take extended trades. Because Comet is good when you're versing very poke laners, like Victor. Um, you can even do it versus like Cassio. You can do it versus... Um, like Orianna, champions like that are very poke oriented, even like Zereth and Velkos. Whereas Electrocute, you go very aggressive, like Zoe, um, LeBlanc, and Aerie, it feels in between. It's like, well, are you versing a low range champion? Well, you might as well just go Electrocute, get more value. Or are you going to be versing a high range matchup? You might as well go Comet. Or are you just going to go Phase Rush and go Scaling? It feels like Aerie's in between, and I'm just not a fan of going in between. It's like the. 50-50, foot, one foot in, one foot out. I'm just not a fan. But the premise is, again, Q-Poke, Q-Poke, Q-Poke. You obviously want to be going Scorch with this page. Um, again, depending on the how heavy trading this matchup is, either Time Warp or Cosmic Insight with Biscuits or Magical Footwear. Again, pretty self-explanatory. But for me, I'm just not a fan. Now, heading into Summoners, guys. Um, the core ones, in my opinion, are Teleport and Ignite. If you want to be playing aggressive, fast pace, solo kills with electrocute or maybe even comet or airy, whatever, you can opt in for you can opt in for ignite. Sorry. Otherwise, majority of the time, I'm just a big fan of going teleport. I like going phase rust with teleport. It's very reliable. Now, what actually happens? What you'll find if you play this style, guys, is that if you go teleport, most likely you're not going to get solo kills. What will happen is that you'll have a re you'll have a really nice early laning phase, most likely with Dorins. You'll get to your 1300 gold or maybe even less if you want to, if you get a, some good trades in lane. What you can actually do is build a wave, teleport back, and just lock them in the lane. And it's a very control-oriented, slow choke. You like choke the opponent out eventually over time rather than going for solo kills. So don't view teleport in, in a defensive manner. It's an aggressive, offensive, and defensive uh, summoner spell choice. Now, again, situational. If you're versing CC, go cleanse. If you're versing some crazy all-in assassins, you can go exhaust. If you're versing like a... Um, sometimes like if you're versing Zed and you're not com comfortable with going Ignite, you can go exhaust. If you're versing a Fizz, you can go exhaust those sorts of champions. And again, um, one thing to note actually before we move on. I've actually found more success going Ignite and going like full glass cannon into a champion like Zed. Because I feel like if I go exhaust and Seekers... He just ignores me in roams, but if I actually go Ignite and Lost Chapter, he's actually so scared, so he can never ro roam, and as long as I hold my E, he can never really kill me. That's just the way I've found um, to shut down Zed a lot more effectively, but again, it, it, it is preference. Now for the build section, guys. So this is incredibly important to understand, and if you don't optimize your itemization on Syndra, 
you're, you're going to be a shell of the champion that you could be. And after I made these adjustments to my build, I found so much more success playing Syndra. So really pay attention here, guys. And trust me, even though it sounds a bit weird, uh, I urge you to try what I'm about to share with you today. Now, starting at the top left-hand corner, for obvious reasons, you either go Crafting Pot or D-Ring. I am a massive advocate for D-Ring on Syndra. It never used to be the case, because back in the day, I always thought that you could only play Syndra very, very fast with Time Warp Tonic, very aggressive, Electrocute Ignite, go for early bases for Dark Seal, play a very fast-paced game. That is the case if you are versing a LeBlanc or very fast-paced, low-range matchups. But again, my personal preference is D-Ring, extended laning phase, works very well with taking 100-0 trades. And what I mean by that is I'm taking trades where I hit a Q, I take 10% of the HP, and they don't take any off me because I can abuse my range advantage. My Q range advantage in most matchups is unparalleled. So, um, and if you do need to go for an early base, you can go for an early double Dorans because Syndra is a champion that can abuse double Dorans extremely well. Now, the first key choice is Ludens or GLP. I always used to love G I always used to love Ludens, sorry, but again, I've become a massive advocate for GLP. I think that this this specific item levels up your threat so much because it increases the reliability of you being able to hit your stun. And if you hit that stun and get that full combo off, you're going to be one shotting people. So GLP isn't just a lane item. It scales incredibly well into mid-game, and your threat on immobile AD carries goes through the roof. And it actually gives you a lot more control and a lot more self-peel. It's a very, very nice, versatile item on Syndra. And if you're not comfortable using it, I, I, I urge you to spend the time to learn and get comfortable with it. Now, this is where the builds get a little bit spicy. So I got this itemization recommendation from one of my pro mid laner friends. And he said, Curtis, I've been playing a lot of Syndra, and I've been having a lot of success with sitting on Fiendish Codex after I get my GLP, and then I go straight into Rabadon's or Spellbinder. And the reason being, he said, he found that at the moment, at the moment, we're in a very squishy meta, and if you farm very well with this scale-oriented approach, you have so much flat AP that your one-shot threat is through the roof. Now, the, the two options here, if we look at the first row and the third row, the difference is one of them you get Fiendish Codex in the middle here, and one of them you go straight into Spellbinder. The difference between these two, I found I find that if you go to base and you don't have enough gold for uh, for a needlessly large rod, you go for this Fiendish Codex, it's a, not, a lot nicer. But if you come out of base after, you know, you've been in lane after your GLP, maybe you get a solo kill and you have enough for a needlessly large rod, just go straight into Spellbinder. That's what I personally like the most. But there is one obvious strength of going Fiendish Codex that you, you guys just might favor more than me. Now, the beautiful thing about Fiendish Codex, it gives you a really nice base amount of uh, CDR, gives you 10% CDR, gives you a nice bit of AP, but more importantly, sitting on Fiendish Codex gives you flexibility because later down the line, you can turn that into a Zonyas or a Banshees, or you can hold on to it and realize at this point here, oh, like, do I actually need, instead of going Rabadons in, or Spellbinder, do I actually need to go a Zonyas or a Banshees first? So it gives you a lot more flexibility and a lot more options in terms of how you want, what you need in the specific game. Um, so it can work very well with Syndra, and it is a preference thing. So try it out. It's a very cheap item. It's only 900 gold or whatever. So try it out. It could be very, very nice for you. Um, so it's either this one is the core one here or this, this third one. Both I actually go 50-50 between the both of them. Um, and it's purely because we're in a very squishy meta. I don't really find that you need um, all that early magic pen. And the one-shot threat on the AD carry, I value way too highly at the moment. Um, I find that all the junglers are very squishy as well. So, And again, you just want to be rounding it out with... Um, Void Staff or Zonyas or Banshees, whatever you need. Now, just a quick little comment between uh, Spellbinder and, and Rabadons. Now, again, this is another controversial thing. I love Spellbinder on Syndra. The, the, no one talks about the movement speed that you actually get with it. Because Syndra is such a, a mobile champion, and moves, movement speed on champions that are skill shot oriented are very, very nice, because it actually increases their ability to get in range and hit that Q. So Spellbinder overall is very, very nice. But more importantly, you stack that up, you're going to be a walking one-shot machine. No one wants to get near you. You have this fully stacked Spellbinder. The AD carry, you start walking up, the AD carry is just going to be like, they're going to dip. They're going to like, no, I don't want to get anywhere near this guy. So the space you create between the GLP, between the Spellbinder, the base movement speed, the phase rush, the gathering storm, you become this mid-game menace. 
a bit of an alliteration there, but uh, a mid-game menace, you just become so annoying to deal with. So try it out, and again, if you're not comfortable with Spellbinder, try it out. I highly, highly recommend uh, Spellbinder over Rabadons. Uh, now, the other one, if you're versing a very... Uh, very frontline heavy tank oriented composition. Again, you just go Ludens or GLP into Leandries, and that's the adaption there. And then in that point, you wouldn't really go uh, Spellbinder because Spellbinder is more for burst. Then you would go like Rabadon's Void Staff for more sustained damage. Um, so again, this second build path is for tank shredding. Now, I've also highlighted here Morellos in the red. It's because. Okay, if you are versing a lot of healing, you can go straight into Morellos after your Ludens or GLP. But a lot of the time, I just value Spellbinder so highly. So if you really don't need Morellos, go straight into the Spellbinder or straight into your Fiendish Codex. This was the build that I used to do. I used to go like Ludens into Morellos all the time because, you know, Morellos has decent amount of burst. But I just found so much more success with this like raw AP, um, very low durability build. And also, the difference between Syndra and how, why Syndra can get away with this is because Syndra, Syndra's defense is very similar to Azir. Syndra's defense is her offense. When you build Spellbinder or Finnish Codex Rabadons, because her range is so high, her threat is so high, no one wants to get near her, so she doesn't need the durability. A lot of other mid-range champions like Zoe, they actually need the durability that Morellos gives you in terms, or Leandris in terms of just the, the HP. But Syndra doesn't need that. Um, that's another reason as to why you don't really need Morellos anymore compar comparatively to other champions as well. And just quickly for early recalls, um, you can go double Dorans. If you, you can also go for an early um, Dark Seal if you're going Corrupting Pot. Again, you should be getting for going for an early refillable as well. If you do need a bit of... Um, armor for these lethality champions like Pantheon or Zed or Kiana. You can sit on a early uh, cloth armor and old, old Null Magic Mantle if you are versing something like a Kassadin for that base MR. And then for boots, I love Sorcerer's, Sorcerer Treads. You really want to be going Sorcery Boots um, whenever you can because um, again, it complements your full AP build very, very nicely. If you can get, and again, remember, threat is your defense. So most likely, a lot of the time I found is if I'm getting CC'd, I'm probably going to die anyway. Like, if, if I'm in that position, the extra tenacities, it's not going to be the be-all, end-all. If, if I'm stunned or in a position to get stunned, I'm probably going to die anyway. I would rather all in on the offensive purposes and use that as my defense, if that makes sense. And Tarvis, again, if you do want to go for that, um, need that extra armor in the game. Now, this is my matchup tier list. Again, just my opinion. And just a quick note, guys. You must adapt runes and builds to truly optimize. You can't go... Like, if this tier list isn't just by taking Phase Rush only, or not only just taking Electrocute. This is taking into account appropriate adaptions in terms of game pace, itemization, um, and rune choices. So, for example, I've got, like, LeBlanc here. If I, if I took Phase Rush and TP, it definitely would not be an A tier matchup. But because... If you know how to play the matchup properly and you go Ignite with Electrocute, um, it's it's easily a favorable matchup for Syndra. And the other thing, guys, is that Jungle massively influences this matchup tier list. Again, because Syndra is the ultimate 1v1 champion. Like, her isolated 1v1 laning is, is, is unparalleled. Like, no one can really match it. That's why, look, there's barely any champions in C tier. One counter in D tier. Um, that's why. That, so... Something to keep in mind, guys. A lot of these A tier matchups, if I have an unfavorable jungle matchup, actually completely shift. And you guys, that is something I'm going to go over later on in this video, but it is important to understand, all right? So let's actually go through a few quick ones that I've highlighted. So down the bottom here, Echo. This is my ban. Um, this is a bit controversial because some people think that Fizz is also an equal counter to, to Echo, but I just feel like Fizz is so much easier to deal with. Um, the damage is so much easier to deal with Whereas Echo just feels like a menace, not because he can kill me, but because I just have no threat. Um, and Echo's side laning is unbelievable. And I just can't punish this Echo in lane. Whereas I can actually punish Fizz in lane. It feels like if I play it really, really well, I can punish Fizz in lane. And Fizz's damage is yeah, just way less, um, way less reliable. That's just my personal preference. I always ban Echo. Um, but other than that, 
Um, I want to highlight Fizz as a counter. It is a counter. It is a good champion into it. But I feel like Echo's is in a tier of its own. And again, this is my opinion. Um, two other ones here, Diana and, and Aurelia. I find them to be quite hard, especially if Aurelia opts in for that wit's end build. And Diana is just too tanky as well and has so much threat. Um, and it can and it can be the just be very, very hard for Syndra to deal with. And keep in mind, guys, there are matchups in here that at lower elo, they probably wouldn't be here. So, for example, a matchup like, you know, a lot of people struggle with a matchup like Lucian mid, or a lot of people struggle with, you know, they'll really struggle with Katarina, or they'll really struggle with Cassidy, or they'll really struggle with Yasuo. But again, this is just talking if played in at my skill level, at the very high level, um, this is what I feel like would happen. Now, another champion I want to highlight here is Katarina. Now, Katarina, I initially thought that Syndra was good into Katarina, but what I realized in Korea, in Korea, they actually used Katarina as a counter to Syndra because you can avoid all the damage. You can actually shun Poe out of the damage before the stun actually hits. So as Syndra's QEing, um, uh, Katarina can just dash, or what do they call it, shun Poe, whatever. He can get out of it. Um, and there's so many ways to avoid Syndra's damage. So Katarina is very, very good at minimizing the laning phase versus Syndra. And there's a lot of threat on Syndra actually as well. Because remember guys, Syndra builds incredibly squishy. Um, and Katarina is great against squishies as well. So that is a very tricky matchup. And so I put it as B tier because it is a skill matchup. I feel like at the highest level and high elo, um, the Syndras are good enough to kind of, and the junglers are good enough to punish his Katarina. But I believe in low elo, this would be a very good counter to Syndra and probably even maybe C or D tier, to be honest with you. Um, and the last one I want to highlight here is this LeBlanc. Like I've said this a few times, but again, as long as you're optimizing for Electrocute Ignite, you're playing very, very aggressively. And what you actually do in this matchup is you put your Q down and you actually always line yourself up with the Q in between the LeBlanc. So whenever LeBlanc uh, W's in, you just E and you tether the W and you get a really guaranteed good trade. And at six, and as soon as you get, especially as soon as you get lost chapter, you just hundred to zero LeBlanc. Um, so yeah, that's my tier list. If you have any questions about that, these matchups, um, you know, if you're in the Patreon, you can ask me in, uh, in depth questions and I'll, I'll answer them and I'll try and get to the, the general public. If you're not part of my Patreon in the comments, but there's no guarantees, but I'll try my best. Now for my take on Syndra's identity. So the first point, guys, is that she thrives against linear, low forms of engage. And this is all because of how the orbs actually interact. So if you think about it, imagine in mid-game, we're in mid-game, and Syndra's in the river, and she's controlling a choke point. And she knows that the enemy has no reliable forms of engage. They're all very linear, no gap closes. She can literally go to that choke point, place a few cues down, and the enemy's just going to be sitting there saying... Who wants to go first? Who wants to get near those orbs? No one wants to get one shot. How are we going to get on the Syndra? They have no way to get on the Syndra, so she has complete control. Whereas on the other hand, if you've got a Camille or like a Fizz flanking, all these champions that can get onto Syndra where she doesn't know where to place her orbs, she can't control that choke point, and she doesn't know when to use her E, it's going to be very hard for her to, do, to reliably do damage in that fight or reliably uh, perform as a champion. It's very similar to Orianna. Um, the next one here is that she thrives with river control and room to play aggressive. And what I mean by this is if your jungler, if you're playing Syndra and your jungler is able to control river vision, put some pinks down, deny the enemy vision, put some aggressive wards maybe on the raptors, things like that. What actually happens is that because Syndra is one of the most oppressive 1v1 isolated laners in the entire game and her weakness is her immobility that won't be able to be punished in this case. She can use her E aggressively for trades and her stun aggressively for trades, which basically opens her up to win any single matchup 1v1. Um, but if she can't use her E aggressively because she has no river control, she's scared of the enemy jungler, she has to respect a lot more, she can't be oppressive in lane, and then the enemy's going to get a lot more room. And that's where they can set up ganks and punish one of the biggest weaknesses of a Syndra, which is her immobility as a champion. The next is that she loves the game being played around her. Because Syndra doesn't have much mobility and she can't roam very well and because she's very immobile and can easily get caught in river and things like that, she doesn't want to have to run to fights. She prefers the game to be played around mid jungle, play around her pressure, go from mid to the sides, not from sides to mid. Um, it just uh, it just feels a lot better to play the game that way when you are playing Syndra. So this is more if you're playing um, Clash or competitive of any form. Play the game around Syndra and she'll perform a lot better because she doesn't want to come to a fight late. It's a lot harder for her to hit her cooldowns. She wants the people to come to her. Because again, if, if people are coming to her, it's a lot easier for her to place her orbs and um, abuse her range advantage. 
The next is that she loves being at fights first and controlling vision, exactly what I said before. If she's there, hiding out of vision, the enemy's not going to want to face check Syndra because it's incredibly scary. And more important, if you're at the fight or the area first, you know where they're going to be coming from. Um, you know if there's going to be flanks because you, ideally you would have plenty of wards out as well. And you know that you can use your E aggressively or time your E perfectly for the only form of engage that they have. Um, you're going to have a lot more threat that way. She prefers to play fights front to back, avoiding flankers, because Syndra is such an immobile champion, um, and she needs to know where to place her orbs and when to use her stun. Um, she doesn't like getting flanked, and she wants to play behind her front line where it can, she can freely throw out her orbs, not really have to worry about any defensive purpose. Um, that's when she can really, really thrive. The next is that she's very immobile and has very limited self-peel, so she requires vigilance of CDs. So if you blow, and, and one of the biggest, most important things of Syndra is that she really needs to play around her ultimate and her E. When she has no ultimate, her threat goes down significantly, and when she has no E, she basically has no self-peel, no mobility, she's a, basically a sitting duck. And on top of that, um, without Flash, she's, again, a very vulnerable champion. And especially since she doesn't want to be building Zonya's early unless she really needs to, she needs that raw AP for that burst threat. If she's not, you know, she's not actually, if she's not threatening people um, for, the, for those one-shots, she, she really doesn't operate as well as a champion. Um, she needs blue buff for obvious reasons. And if you do get blue buff, once you get blue buff, lost chapter, you can basically dominate a game. She does not like the side lane. Her side laning is terrible. Because kind of like what I said before, she needs to be at the fights from the start. She doesn't want to be flanking. She doesn't want to be coming in from the side. She needs to play fights front to back. Um, and she's very immobile. So she doesn't want to be getting caught in river and things like that. She's great into squishy team compositions, but she can adapt. Like I said before, you can go into Leandre's shred front line, but she is much better into squishy team compositions that are scared of, of getting one shot. And she thrives actually when she's the only AP on the team. So if she is the only AP on the team and the enemy really can't build much MR, um, it feels incredible. It feels really, really, really nice. Um, and she can play both the isolated 1v1 well and 2v2s, which is very unique. There's not many mid champions in the game that can play 1v1s quite equally as well as they can do 2v2s. Whereas champions like Orianna, their 2v2s are meh. Whereas Syndra's 2v2 is actually quite decent. Um, and her, isol her isolated 1v1 is, you know, god mode. Now for a few ways to play the early lane, guys. The first one is the old heavy trade and contest. This is what I used to do all the time on Syndra. It's a very crazy heavy trade, chaotic way of playing Syndra, which, again, it used to be the meta. Everyone used to play Syndra like this, but I feel like the game or the meta has evolved, and I only really do this when I'm versing LeBlanc and Silas, a very aggressive melee matchups, sometimes even versus Zed and things like that, but you generally want to be going Electrocute and Ignite in this case, using your E very aggressively, keeping the wave in the middle, even slightly pushing, and going for early bases for Dark Seal and things like that, but I feel like the game's evolved, and I feel like 90, you know, 80 to 90% of the time, I play this very slow, patient, holding the wave in the middle, or, or even slightly on your side, where you can actually walk past the wave, and just go teleport, phase rush, or comment. This is what I do into most mage matchups like Orianna, Victor, etc. Uh, even though versus something like Orianna, I'd go phase rush, whereas versus Victor, I'd probably go comment. But um, again, I want you guys to experiment with this and actually feel the difference. It's a very different style of playing uh, Syndra. And the third one is a slow build and poke, and it's only good if you have a good jungle matchup. So Traditionally, I always used to slow build and poke into a matchup like Fizz and Kassadin, but what I actually realized was if you don't have a good jungle matchup and they, the enemy jungler has a lot more pressure than your, and they're going to actually control river, then what I actually do is just try and hold the wave in the middle or try and push it very fast, bounce the wave. Fizz will get level two first, but then I try and freeze it around level three on my side of the lane. Um, so th again, this is only if you have a good jungle matchup, you can do it into these melee matchups. Now for the Syndra item journey. Now, th this may look weird comparatively to my Orianum, Rumble, and Galio uh, guides, but this is what makes one of the reasons why Syndra is so strong. Look at this. Your first items, like your level one, you have Dorans or Corrupting Pot. You are relatively strong. You're in the green. You're not god mode, but you're relatively strong. 
on your first base, if you have to base for an early Dorian's or an early Dark Seal, you're still really strong. As you get to your Lost Chapter, this is where you already turn God Mode. You're super, super strong at Lost Chapter. You're really, really strong at Ludens. You dip a little bit as you're getting your Fiendish Codex, but then you turn God Mode again. This is so... This feels so unfair. Like, when you play Syndra, in my opinion, like, when you play Orianna, for example, there's obvious troughs in damage. But Syndra, it's like, as long as you farm well, you get to your Lost Chapter, you get to your core, um, you know, item, whether it's Ludens or GLP, you work towards your Spellbinder and your Fiendish Codex, whatever it is, you always feel strong. It doesn't feel like you have a trough. I don't, I don't know why. Maybe this is just me. Maybe I'm interpreting wrong. In my games, in my experience... I just don't feel weak at any point unless I'm behind. And that's my note here, guys. In an alternate universe where you do get behind early, maybe you don't CS well at all, you die early, you blow flash, you can't punish your lane art, whatever it is, you will basically never feel strong. So the way I see Syndra, it's like feast or famine. You get behind early game, you're done. Like your, your game's done in my opinion. Um, but if you, you know, you play slow, patient, farm well, get to your key spikes, your god mode, from, you don't you don't fall off ever. And I just feel like this is one of the biggest reasons, in my opinion, why Syndra is so strong. Um, and I don't know why this is the case. And especially with this Phase Rush build with Gathering Storm and uh, Spellbinder and this very raw AP scaling with Phase Rush and things like that. Because actually, one thing that's interesting, because you have so much self peel with Phase Rush and your range and threat is so high, you're not having to buy early defensive items and HP and things like that, which again keeps your AP very high. But more importantly, a lot of the time, Gathering Storm makes up for that, that little trough that you would have had anyway as well. There's just like little things with this rune and this specific way of playing Syndra that feels very, very nice. Now for Syndra Micro, guys. So the first point here is that Syndra W is much easier to use without Smartcast. I find that smart casting Syndra W is similar to smart casting Rumble R. The accuracy is going to go down a lot. It's going to feel very awkward to use. Just try, try it without it. See how it feels. If it feels comfortable for you to smart cast it, go for it. I've just found with me and my clients, um, without smart cast, it's just a lot better. Now, this is a very, very important point, guys. Q accuracy is incredibly important. The amount of Qs you hit is directly correlated with the quality of the laning phase you will have. Now, this may sound very obvious, like, duh, Curtis, the more cues you hit, the better game you're going to have. But trust me, people don't... What I've found with Syndra players is that they're very blasé about the amount of cues they hit. They're like, oh, I just... I missed that one. It's fine. Don't worry about it. I missed these three cues. It's all good. If you hit those three cues that you just missed, the lane's completely different. This guy has to use both his pots or maybe at least one of his pots. You do that again. He uses both of his pots. Then he has to go to base. Or you miss all of them he gets the same lane forever, or you hit all of them, he gets the base early, you get a tempo base, you get better recall, you get more river control, R river control snowballs for Syndra, because with river control, you become a much more dangerous champion. It, people don't talk about, and they don't review hitting cues. So really pay attention in your VOD reviews for why you're missing cues, and how you can better optimize uh, your cues in lane. And I'll talk about this when we get into the VOD review. And since the Syndra Q changes, you must know the range accurately before um, it would kind of compensate and make it easier for you because like even if you didn't know the Q range, it would move you closer to, to make sure you hit it. But now it will just cast it at that range um, and you know, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. So you must know the Syndra Q range, go into practice tool and get very comfortable with that. Um, and you must be comfortable with doing the fadeaway Q. So again, one of the strengths of Syndra is that it's similar to Victor's E or Oriana's Q, the exact same thing. You can move while queuing. And that's really, really, really strong. Because if you think about it, a lot of champions that you punish, you'd punish by using your ability when they stop to auto attack a creep or when they stop to CS. Now, the thing with Syndra, why she's so hard to punish is that she can just move constantly and poke you at the same time. That's really, really unfair, and I think it's a very strong uh, micro-interaction. So uh, you need to be comfortable with doing the fadeaway queue. So as you're walking backwards, queuing behind you to hit the queue at the same time. And then we'll get into the rest of the micro-details within the VOD uh, that I go over specifically. Now for the biggest misconceptions and mistakes. So let's cover the biggest misconceptions first. The first misconception is that Syndra does not scale. And this was a misconception that I had. I thought that Syndra didn't scale. And it was all because of the build, and it was because of the rune choices, and it was because of the meta. Now, Syndra usually operates well in metas that are very squishy, 
and she operates, um, and she doesn't scale well, yeah, against very uh, heavy frontline. But more importantly, if you're going electric time up tonic, um, if you're crazy heavy trading build, things like that, she doesn't really scale that well. But now I've realized that this is a misconception. Syndra does scale well if you do the right things, you farm well, you itemize correctly, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, now it's a pretty big misconception. Syndra will win every lane. Um, so this is again another misconception. People think, oh, you pick Syndra, you win every matchup. If I ban Echo, you win every matchup. That's just not the case. As I mentioned before, jungle difference is incredibly, it alters the lane massively. So if I have a Zac or a Sidwani and they have a Rek'Sai or a Lee Sin or something like that or something with gank setup with their mid jungle and I can't play aggressively and I can't use my E aggressively or I, I'm so scared of ganks, um, and I'm going to have to give pressure, and I'm getting poked under tower, I can't do anything. And Syndra just won't win the lane, and I won't get pressure. So you can't expect Syndra to get pressure every time if you're not thinking about the jungle matchup. Syndra will be effective as long as they get a good lane matchup. So this is what I was talking about before as well, but less about the jungle, more about the comp. So even in, let's just say hypothetically, um, I get a good mid 1v1 matchup. So maybe I'm playing Syndra into Victor or Syndra into Cassio or something, right? Syndra into Rise. But what will happen, yes, I have a good lane matchup and that is great. And that, that's, that's a tick in the right direction or a step in the right direction for me being effective in that game. But it, what if I'm versing like a, a Bard, I'm versing a Camille, I'm versing a Rek'Sai, or not even a Rek'Sai, something even more like Elise, very annoying champions that can get onto me, close that gap, um, non-linear engage. In mid game, or even like early game, I'm actually not gonna find as much success, even in a good matchup, because the comp counters me. When it does get to mid game, I'm not gonna be able to perform well, because um, people are coming in from different directions, I don't know where to put my orbs, there's gonna be a lot of chaos, I'm blowing flashes, I'm gonna have to build an early Banshees, because Bard ult, all these things will actually make Syndra not feel um, that effective in the game. Now for some big mistakes. Syndra using E aggressively without understanding the map state. This is probably the biggest, most common mistake. Um, again, your E is your only form of self-peel. So, and especially after the next patch, I believe they're, then they're, they're uh, what are they doing? They're adding the cooldown, uh, increasing the cooldown of Syndra E. So you've got to be very, very careful about when you're using it. So if you don't have any river control and you don't know where the enemy jungler is and you use your E aggressively, then you're just gonna have to blow flash if they come. Like you need to be very careful about the way you use your E and when you use it. Um, not adapting build path, runes, game plan effectively. So again, you need to know when to take electrocute and ignite, when to take phase rush TP. And more importantly, when you're in the game, what to build. And after that, how do you want to adapt the way you play the game? Because Syndra is a champion that feels strong all the time. Like you're a champion that can literally Q, W, E. If you just spam abilities, you will take great trades. So what happens? It's like, it's like, you know, um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, when all the kids go to the, um, that, that, the Chocolate Factory for the first time. And there's that one kid who like eats everything and they get like super sick and fall into the river or whatever that happens. They eat too much chocolate. Now, it's the same with Syndra players. Like they, they realize they get so greedy. They're like, oh my God, I can just win lane all the time. They start to, spam abilities all the time. And then they're playing Phase Rush Syndra with TP. They have no mana. They get forced out, lose a bunch of CS, get behind the curve, can't get to the items, um, can't attend that, that skirmish that they would have otherwise, start taking heavy trades when, again, they want to scale. All these things, it, they just start playing without without the overall game plan and pace of the game that they specifically had in mind. Um, that's funny. I actually came up with that Charlie and the Chocolate Factory uh, analogy off the top of my head like that. That kind of does make sense, doesn't it? But it's a little weird um <laughs> playing the champion too fast and chaotic so again like i said before i think in this current meta you can play it fast and chaotic my personal preference of playing syndra is very cool calm collected scaling um and just in terms of trading and mana usage i try not to heavy trade too much i try not to burn too much mana i play off my ma uh, mana flow band very very calculated and the last one here is rushing to use R without getting your orbs down. So keeping in mind that the more orbs that are on the ground, if you don't need to use your R first, unless you're doing the RE combo where you get all the orbs and your E, um, if you don't need to do that and you can hold on to your R as long as possible, you can make, you might be able to get two or three orbs on the ground, then R, then you have a lot more um, 100 to zero threat. 
Now for jungle combos, junglers that can utilize Syndra's pressure to control river and invade feel the best. More importantly, and more specifically, tempo junglers, they're the nicest. So this is tempo junglers like Graves and Olaf with very, very good clears. Um, they feel amazing because what happens they full clear they base they're stronger than the enemy jungler They walk into river they control vision they invade and I know then I know exactly where the enemy jungler is I can use my e aggressively if there's a 2v2 I can get them get there first back them up win the 2v2 They just feel really really nice to play with and remember guys um, Syndra performs best when she doesn't feel threatened and can use e aggressively without any consequences Why having river control is very important and specifically Graves and Olaf, not just because they're the tempo junglers, but because of CC and DPS. Now, I actually got this when I was a coach from one of my players, Shernfire. And he said to me, I love playing a jungler. I don't like when the jungle and the mid lane are both CC oriented. I like it when one is more CC, one offers the CC, and one offers the damage. So it's a lot cleaner that way. So for example, you don't want to have Lissandra Sejuani. You want to have Lissandra Graves or Lissandra Kindred. Something with all damage and then all CC type thing. So with Syndra, for example, because she already offers the CC within the combo, yes, you can go Syndra Elise. That's completely fine. But what you actually find is that it makes building mercs and things like QSS and taking cleanse much more valuable. And then over time, once they get that mercs or they take cleanse, your threat goes down um, massively. But um, that's why I prefer to play champions that have full damage with Syndra, ideally. And tempo jungles, things like that. But also, Lisa and Rexai are really, really great. And I don't like Zac and Sedge, purely because a lot of the time we're not going to have any river control because their early skirmishing is really bad. They get bullied out by more aggressive junglers. They're full clearing, but they're slow and they take too long to scale and they're not going to back me up and get river control. So I can't um, do what I want to do. Now, lastly, how to counter Syndra. So the first point here is that Syndra hates multi-threat comps and Chancer can flank and come from the side in mid-game. I covered this earlier on, but again, it's all because of all placements. So champions like Shaco, Camille are very, very annoying. Very similar to Orianna in that sense. So if, you, if, you're, if you're familiar with playing Orianna or you're familiar with my Orianna guide, it's, it's the exact same concept there. Syndra hates when the enemy has river control and Syndra is scared to walk into the river, can't use E aggressively. And the great way to force this against a Syndra is have a winning bot 2v2 and play a roaming support. Champions like Pike, Alistar, Nautilus, Bard, Bard specifically, Bard is Syndra's worst nightmare, purely because Bard ultimate counters Syndra so hard. Because she has no dashes, she can't get out of Bard ult. So Bard just comes mid, ulties, blows Syndra flash, done. You just blown her, old, her flash just like that. So what you should actually do versus Syndra, try and get a winning bot 2v2 and, or maybe even a favorable jungle matchup, try and get river control against Syndra, and then she's going to be a shell of a champion that um, she would have otherwise been. Uh, and trust me, Bard is very, very annoying for Syndra players. Syndra is very reliant at being at the fight first. So for example, if the fight is breaking out somewhere far away from her, she doesn't really have great mobility or great roaming, and it's very hard for her to reliably get her damage off if everyone's super, super far away. She wants people to come to her. She wants to control those choke points, utilize her threat, utilize her range advantage, um, and you know, have people coming in from the same area. When she's coming in from the side or she's coming in late from a fight, it just makes herself vulnerable. It makes it really awkward for her to play fights. She's gonna most likely have to use E defensively. And once she uses E defensively, she's going to find it hard to navigate the fight because, again, her W and her Q are skill shots. And if they're not stunned, it's going to be really hard to hit those abilities. So you're just going to do way less damage. And, she, and also, she can't face check. If she face checks, she gets one shot because, again, you're not utilizing that range advantage, all those things. And lastly here, guys, Syndra is a champion that really, really struggles in the side lane. So if you ever have Rift Herald against Syndra... Uh, what you should actually do is try and find a way to break that mid tower, which is going to force the AD carrying support to go mid, or at least keep Syndra mid for a, a little bit, push her all the way to tier 2. She's going to have no river control, which we know is really bad for Syndra. But more importantly, once she gets to the side lane, she's going to really struggle to find a way to get into the fight. Um, and actually, sorry, lastly, this wasn't the last point. Syndra is very blue reliant. So it's like versing Anivia, Anivia in a way, or Orianna. If you can deny that blue, so maybe you have a strong, say you're versing, uh, say Syndra's on blue side, and the enemy has a strong top matchup and a good jungle matchup, maybe they invade that second blue spawn with the top pressure, deny that blue buff off Syndra, it can really, really make Syndra's laning phase incredibly hard to navigate. 
So what we're going to do now is jump into the VOD. This is all there is for the theory section. So if you have any questions about the theory section of this guide, feel free to hit me up below in the comments or if you're in my Discord in the Patreon section, I'll answer all your questions. Um, but now let's get into the gameplay, guys. So for the first VOD of the day, guys, this one's going to be me playing Syndra into Kale, which is a relatively easy matchup for me, even though this guy is actually a Kale Master Tier Kale one trick. And instead of using my early advantage to, to go for solo kills, take Electrocute Ignite or Comet Ignite, go, 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 Time Warp Tonic, Corrupting Bot, play very, very fast, I'm deciding to use my early advantage to guarantee the scaling, value my CS, guarantee that I get to my key item spikes, take Gathering Storm, Cosmic Insight, Magical Footwear, TP, D-Ring Start, very scaling oriented like I spoke about in the theory section of this guide, because I know that if I go and guarantee my early farm, um, and I play the lane very calculated, I can basically 1v9 most games. And just because it's a KO, he won't outscale me. Trust me. Yes, he outscales me if he gets the three items, level 16, whatever. But the game will be way over before then. As soon as I get my lost chapter, blue buff, like, or GLP, it's done. He can't even lane against me anymore. Now, first thing I like to do, guys, in this laning phase is I like to auto-attack one of the minions first. This is because if you don't do that, all three are probably going to die at the same time. So it's really hard for you to auto-attack each of them and get all three CS at the start. So make one really obviously low. Now, actually, before we go into it, you guys like to hear what is my overarching objective in each lane. Now, as Syndra, because you're such a flexible champion and so much can happen in the early game because you generally win lane, it's hard to pinpoint what will happen, how much gold I'm going to base on, etc. I'm completely fine with basing for a second D-ring with a refillable um, and a pink or something. I'm completely fine with that happening. But I'm, I'm also completely fine and ideally, in, a, in an ideal world, I would actually get to stay in lane for 1300 gold, utilizing my mana regen off my D-ring, utilizing my pots, utilizing my TP, getting a very good tempo base or a very solid base without missing any CS, get to my lost chapter for free, um, scaling quite nicely. That's, that's in an ideal world, if I can do that. So that's like my main objective, my, my main mindset. But again, all I'm thinking about is maxima maximizing my CS in the early game and not really trying to limit how many I'm going to miss. Now, first little thing, guys. I'm always, always, always trying to time my Q when this person goes up to CS. So what I'm thinking already is, okay, I could have thrown out way more Qs already. You know, I could throw two out by the time um, this KL actually goes for a CS. But what again, what I'm trying to do is ration out my mana. I don't want to waste all my mana. I want to, again, have a long extended laning phase, get to my 1300 gold. Yes, I'm probably not going to be able to punish this KL as much, but... I don't, I'm not, it's not worth it, in my opinion, if I'm going to miss CS for it. So I focus on my CS, I wait for Kale to stop, um, to actually auto-attack one of these, because I actually knew that Kale most likely was going to Q one, and then auto-attack the next one. So I'm waiting for Kale to stop, where I can use my Q and guarantee to proc my mana flow band. And yes, this, this may be a bit slower, but you still do punish um, players this way, trust me. And I'll even show it within this video. So again, when my mana flows down, I'm really trying not to use my Q very often. I'm only trying to use it when I can guarantee to hit it, when I know it's like high high likelihood of hitting the Q and uh, my mana flow my mana flows actually off cooldown. So I guarantee get those those uh, those minions. I know I'm gonna get level two first. So I actually walk up to generate a little bit of threat there. Last hit that Q that uh, that minion. Sorry. Now most players right now would actually Q E. Now. I've experimented with this. I've experimented with rushing QE level 2, go, 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 heavy trade. But what I've realized is there's actually the inherent threat of holding your E creates more space and actually generates more threat in the lane. So what I actually decide to do, I'm trying right now to go, to go for a Q on this KO, actually miss it or they dodge it. I'm zoning this KO from even getting close to the CS. I'm waiting for KO to stand still to actually cast Q or whatever. But what I realized, if I just Q it, hold my E, Kale always has to respect my E cooldown and never wants to get close to get stunned. So I actually generate more threat and can create more space and play more aggressive by holding my E. And it's great for two reasons. Creating more threat, I can deny more CS, but more importantly, um, I don't need to spend that mana. So it's a very, it's a very, um, it's a very different way of playing Syndra, but I just find it very, very quite nice. It feels very nice. So I'm CSing quite well, not really queuing too often, only when I really think I'm going to be able to hit that Q. Like that, beautiful, auto attack whenever I can. Cool, calm, collected. And I'm not worried about Kale's outscaling me. Yes, if Kale gets like level 16 or whatever, um, you know, yes, she'll she'll be strong. But I mean, as soon as I get lost chapter or GLP, the game's over. Like she can't, she no one can deal with, with my threat. 
So just playing very, very slow here, valuing my CS, not spamming too many abilities. Now using this opportunity to get a ward on one side that I can lean to because Syndra really wants to be able to um, lean to one side to abuse my range advantage. Now this happens quite often in a lot of lanes, um, whether it's versus Orianna or any mage where I just can bully early. I push in the first one or two waves, whatever, and then I actually let it bounce out. A big mistake Syndra players do is that they just hold the wave there, they keep queuing these minions now, auto attack, auto attack, auto attack, and they never let the wave come out, um, and then it's really hard to bully this person under tower, and you're not, you're not going to be able to abuse your early advantage by keeping them under tower. If you let the wave come out, you're going to be able to hold it on your side, freeze it, deny them CS, and more importantly, um, build another slow, you know, build another wave, few waves into uh, into a crash for a good reset. You'll see what I mean when I when it uh, as this kind of vod pans out. And notice that look at that. Every single time I'm holding my Q until I know Kale has to last hit. Beautiful. So I'm using I'm directing my attention both to what's the enemy minion HP and my minion HP. And notice how much mana I have. And look at that. Look at this, this is a perfect example. So right now by holding my Q, I know this is going to die very, very soon. So if I walk up and Q now as this KO wants the last hit, KO has to make a choice. Do I want to take the Q to the face and get this minion? Or do I actually want to dodge backwards, avoid this Q damage, but miss the minion? If you do this enough and you don't waste your E and you just hold your E the whole time, they're going to get really far behind in CS because they don't want to take that damage. Um, and I'll show you what I mean. This KO gets really far behind in farm because I'm playing so calculated. I'm punishing this KO every single time, every CS they walk up from. I'm not randomly throwing Qs. So every, and the, the great thing about holding Qs, guys, is if I hold it for every single time the, min, the, the minion's low for KO, then um, I'm going to have it up every single time. But if I throw a Q now, randomly, Q, 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 then there's going to be windows where Kale's going to be able to walk up and, and get the CS while my Q is down. So you've got to keep that in mind. There's, there's the opportunity cost by spamming Q as well. So I'm, going to, I'm leaning onto the bot side. Beautiful. Got my vision. I see my jungle in top side here. I'm just punishing, 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 letting the wave come to me. And again, if my jungler comes and there's a 2v2, I know we win this. So I lean there straight away. Because my 2v2 is actually pretty good. At level 4, my with Phase Rush full combo, we like 2v2s are, are very, very solid. Now, another little thing here, guys. Look at this. So, wait, I want to go back a little bit here. Where is it? I think it's here. And I'm standing outside the wave as well. Oh, one thing I wanted to comment on, that's what it was, was the wave. Notice the wave. So this is the strength of doing this strategy. You push it in, bounce it out, let it come back to you instead of just keeping it under tower. Now, Kale's going to have such a hard time breaking this freeze and getting it and like, breaking it by putting it into my tower. Because I And you'll notice what I do in a second. I don't just hard shove the wave. I, I thin it a little bit, making sure it's not going to like build too big. But I'm getting it in this really nice juicy position where Kale's going to be extremely threatened um, and have a hard time breaking this freeze that's going to happen. So Aurelia comes in. And right now, I actually miss my E. For some reason, I thought that Aurelia was going to path down because i knew that she wanted bot scuttle so i see my orb here now this is something that will come with time and experience when you're playing syndra you need to utilize the orbs that are already onto the ground on the ground so i when i'm thinking about stun i'm not thinking about oh, okay it can only stun when my next q comes up i'm thinking about utilizing the orbs that are already on the ground so i thought that aurelia was going to like path like that around this orb and then behind it but i was just going to look to e so i was trying to reposition my character to get that stun off but then she like faked she faked the uh, the path, and then I, I kind of get a W on the back end. But that's like a really not a good use of W here, guys. I want to talk about that, actually. This is not a good use of mana. So I missed the E, which uses so much mana, and then I use a W, which does nothing. W is so expensive. It's the most expensive ability. It's 60 mana compared to 50 and 50 of my Q and E. And it does nothing. It barely does any damage. It's a slow. You, uh, w is a luxury ability. You only use W in lane if... Um, you know, it's for a 100 zero combo with your jungler, or you're setting up a gank, or you need it to CS uh, a minion that you need to get when you have a lot of mana. That's the only reasons you should be using W. You shouldn't be using W for trades randomly in lane like that. So now, now look how awkward this is. It's going to get really, really awkward in a second for this Kale. So one thing you guys notice is, I use my abilities once, and look at my mana pool. My mana pool's drained so much just from that one little skirmish. And this is what you re I really try to avoid on Syndra. 
if the skirmish is important, I'll do it and use my mana pool and, you know, go for that, that kill. But if I, if I can avoid using my W and E, I try not to. Because again, I want to extend out this landing phase and get to my 1300 gold. And that's a good thing about Doran's though, is that it has mana regen on top of it. So, um, it's not a big deal, but it is something to think about. Understand the, you know, the trade-off for using those abilities. So I'm just leaning onto the bot side here because that's where my Jonga is. And again, it's the same stuff here. I'm always trying to time my cues with abilities, making this this Kale's life really, really hard. This Kale's doing a decent job of like um, of dodging my abilities, but look at this. This is bad, really bad by me because I actually make mistakes this game. I'm not, I'm not a robot. So this wave was getting very big. And I knew that a rally, I saw a rally here on Wolves. So what this said to me, my brain, my default response is, wait, he's in an isolated 1v1. His wave's in a bad spot. My jungler's in river. They have no vision or they don't know where my jungler is or, or I have the jungle control or the jungle strength here because their jungler's on Wolves right now. So I can play aggressively and potentially make him low so he's going to be vulnerable to a gank. But I just feel like in hindsight here, I should just play patient, thin the wave. Kale still can't break this like little temporary semi-freeze semi, semi -freeze or whatever it is. And I use my W and I miss my E here. I go out of range and I use too much mana. So then what happens? I ping my E. I tell my jungle I don't have E and I don't have any mana to set up this gank. So one thing I, I learned, I, you know, I want you guys to take from this little series of events here is E. Mana, two things. Mana... Uh, mana rationing and being aware of mana and, and cooldowns. But more importantly, your E in terms of being um, your only form of gank setup as well. So what happens if I use my E for a heavy trade and then my jungler comes, I have no gank setup for two reasons. I have no mana, but I can't lock this person in place. So I miss my E here. My E has a very large cooldown. Uh, and now when my jungler comes, I can't do anything, which is really, really lame. So that's um, just poor ga gameplay from me. And that's something I would review and just, and, you know, over time refine that. Oh, yeah, okay, here I shouldn't use it, shouldn't use it. Now look at this. Because I've got the wave bounce back to me, Kale's trying to get the wave in. I can just hold it, abuse my range advantage, prevent Kale from uh, from breaking this. Now I can just keep it outside my tower here, so which is super, super nice for me. But I've got a nice little freeze going on here. And again, I'm happy. If, worst case scenario, Kale comes back. Um, off a reset, I've denied heaps of creeps and I can just TP back whenever I want with my lost chapter. So I'm happy to stay here because my main goal is 1300 gold here. I haven't got to 1300 gold yet. I've got one of my pots ticking. I'm trying to zone this Kale. Now their jungler has to come mid and fix the wave. So the jungler actually comes mid here and then fixes the wave. And I'm completely fine with that because Kale misses all that CS anyway. Uh, has to share XP. I actually get all this solo XP by myself and I get to my 1300 gold. So I'm stoked. Beautiful. Look at that. And look at the CS difference, guys. 17 to 46. Yes, I haven't killed Kale. I didn't even force Kale to use both the pots. But because I played the, the lane, the, the waves really well, I lent to my jungle, used my vision really well. I timed my Q. I stayed quite... My mana pool was quite healthy, so I generated a lot of threats. So Kale can never really freely walk up. I denied so much CS. And look at that. That's just from solid laning. Okay, solid, solid laning there. 30 CS advantage. Now I've got my lost chapter. Beautiful. First spike here, guys. Really, really nice. And I don't even need to TP back here because the, the next wave was actually a cannon. They've actually took ghosts. They didn't take TP. So I just walked back to lane here. So fast forward a little bit here. Now, this is where my first spike really comes into play. This is where I can really start to have a, have a bigger mana pool. I can probably use my Q a lot more now um, and have a lot of threat knowing that I'm going to hit six soon. So this Kale's trying to get the wave in. She's done a good job of that, so I'm trying to punish him. So look at that. So I knew that Kale was desperate to get this wave in because she uh, didn't want it to freeze. So, and I knew right now that there's no way Aurelia was hovering. Aurelia had to reset, go back to a jungle. There's no way Aurelia's here. So I know I can aggressively, and the wave's not in a bad spot for me. I can use my E aggressively here. So I use my E for a big trade. Look at this. Q, E, W, beautiful auto attack. No, I hit six. Chase, chase, chase. She dodges my Q. Auto attack, auto attacking the whole time. Dodges my Q again. And then I R. And then um, she actually has, uh, what's it called? Null, null shield? Null... Or what, 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 no magic or whatever it is, the, what, the MR one. So let's look at this, break this down. So I know I'm hitting six soon. I know the jungle's not near. My theory was that the jungle wasn't near. My wave's in a good spot. Kale's very squishy. I hit my key item spike. 
So I get a beautiful trade here. I get six. I walk forward, proc my phase rush, run, run, run. And this is the strength of phase rush. Again, it's not just defensive, it's offensive. I can chase people down. I can prevent them from chasing me. I can play aggressively. Phase rush really unlocks you as a champion. But the the really annoying thing here is that Kay was very good at dodging my, my Qs, or maybe I'm just bad at hitting Qs. And that actually reiterates my point of how important hitting Qs is. Because if I if I hit that one or that one or that one, any of these ne these next Qs, this this KO actually dies. And notice how I don't use my R straight away. I wait for Qs because remember, guys, the more balls and the more Qs that are on the ground, the more damage your R is going to do. So I try to Q as many times as possible, then R. I don't, I don't R, then Q after. Yes, yeah, so she has a null magic orb or whatever it is to nullify some of that, um, nullifying orb, that's what it's called, nullifying orb, to, to nullify some of my, my burst, so, uh, not really much I can do there. So the wave's in a still good spot for me, so I just chill. And then she tries to come back, I get, I miss my stun, unfortunately, but then she, uh, she ends up dying. Anyway, so I want to break this down, actually. Why I missed this stun? This is what I would do in review. I was like, why would I miss... How did I miss this stun? Because I knew my support was coming. The wave's in a good spot. Chaos trying to break it. Yes, I don't have ult. So, I, it's too obvious. Too telegraphed. This is something I have learned. And it's so obvious right now that I'm walking up to QE. So, what I think I should do here, and something I... I, I for me, I'm still improving on, is I think I should put my Q, wait for the... And then position my character this way or this way, depending on how they path, rather than just using QE straight away, because it's too, it's way too, you can just foresee, it's so easy to see, so I think rather than there, I hold my, my E a little bit, wait for them to move, and then I, I path my character to try and line up that E, because there's two ways of using QE, oh, I just want to quickly talk about this actually, like I said before, you can QE as a combo, like Q onto them and E, and it's a very reliable way to hit E, but another way of using E is you just Q, leave it on the ground, go back to CSing a little bit. They will either lose track of the orb or they have to respect it, which actually just creates space. Then you E, trying to line up the E while it's on the orb. And yes, you're not going to get that Q damage, that Q E damage, but you can Q on the back end when your Q's off cooldown. Um, so it's another way of kind of lining up that stun. But anyway, I miss it. I miss the W as well, but we get the kill anyway. Beautiful. So... Get the way. I think I, I I see the way. Just to check if the next wave is a cannon or not. I'm trying to get the next wave in. I know that my jungler is not here. I know the jungler is in the area, but I still felt safe to to quickly get this wave in. So I'm leaning onto the top side here, knowing that the jungler is in Bot River. I use my E for the wave, whatever, and my W. But I um, get all those creeps and I go for a quick recall here. Beautiful. Get a refillable, amplifying tomb, pink ward, TP back to lane. So I could have played that whole series of events much better, but, um, you know, room for improvement. So now um, I'm really kind of trying to put on the hurt on this Kale. I, I know that um, she has a lot of movement speed. She has tier 1 boots and a W. It's really, really annoying. But I have a lot of mana to play with. Once I get Lost Chapter, I feel very... Um, I feel very free. I feel like I can just spam a lot more abilities than I could have. And I have 70 CS to 36 as well, which is super nice. So I get some vision control to lean onto one side. And now I start to play a little bit more aggressively here. I'm trying to, she's trying to tether me. I'm trying to tether her. But again, worst case scenario, even if I don't um, punish this Kale, I'm completely fine with scaling to my GLP as well. So as long as I'm denying Kale CS, and as long as I'm getting good CS, I don't feel like I'm in a rush because I want to talk a bit about mindset because a lot of the time when I used to play Syndra, I always felt like I was in a rush. If I'm versing a champion like Victor or Kale, I always felt like I had to kill them. But then with this build, I, don't, I just don't feel that pressure. I don't feel like I need to kill them all the time and it relieves a lot of pressure off me and I feel a lot more comfortable just scaling. I don't know. It's just a bit of a weird mindset thing, but it feels very nice. But now anyway, I've got my vision. I'm leaning... Beautiful. I go for a nice full chunk here. Really, really nice combo. Reposition with my phase rush. Get another Q. And then I decide, all right, let's just trade ults. Because I believe that my ult is uh, way less valuable than KO ult. Purely because I can kill KO without my ult. But she can't do anything without ult. She has literally no defensive capabilities now. So I ping the ult. Begin to build a wave in. 
I really want my blue. I was pinging on the way to blue. I thought I was going to get handed blue here. But uh, Talia was looking for a top gank. And notice how I'm very rarely looking for side lane plays. As 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 Syndra, I'm 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 very focused on my lane, and I'm not really focused on I'm shot like I'm focused on my CS. I'm focused on my XP, staying super super efficient, getting really solid bases, um, denying the enemy CS. I'm not focused on roaming too much. This is just the way I like to play Syndra. There are Syndras that play very roam heavy and chaos and that sort of thing. That's the way I used to play Syndra, but I've just decided to just take a chill build with this with this style, and it's just gotten me a lot more success. I've just won a lot more games doing this very um slow calculated style so i know that i can get my glp very very soon so i know i can just get one more wave recall get my glp actually what happens here oh, okay so my support actually roams up again so i believe i hit the stun this time so i get a stun beautiful into the flay into the q into the q again nice and i know that she didn't have ult because i pinged the ult talia took blue unfortunately which is very bad for me because I'm such... I can utilize blue very, very well. So I think I stay here. Because I didn't want to allow Aurelia to shove in this wave. I just wanted to make sure that um, Aurelia didn't really get anything here. It looks like Aurelia was trying to look for something onto me. So she jumps onto that creep. I'm trying to bait her in a little bit here. Because I know my jungle's hovering me. Dodge the stun. And then I ult and then E. Okay, so I want to talk a bit about this because there's so many ways I can play this. This one's awkward. So I was trying to bait her in. She goes in. She, she E's. Right now, what I was worried was that if I R E, if I R E now, she's going to Q and I'm not going to be, and then walk and I'm not going to be, the, the E's not going to be in range to stun. That was my thought process. So, my thought process was, eventually, if I just keep following her, she's going to have to turn back onto me, and we're going to kill her. But I think that there's so many ways to play this. Because she dashes there, and I'm like, alright, she's not going to be able to... She's not going to be able to escape now, so I hold my R, then I RE. Because my mindset in these in these very dash-heavy champions is I always want to RE first, because if I R, all the orbs are going to be on the ground, and no matter where she dashes, she's still going to get stunned. But conversely, versus dash champions that dash onto you, whether it's LeBlanc, Aurelia, or Yasuo, you can actually E the initial dash. So right now, if Aurelia now Qs onto me, I can actually buffer the dash with my E. So that was my other thing that was conflicted. Do I R E here, or do I E first, then Q on the ground to get more orbs than R? So basically, the two combos would be E to, to disrupt the Aurelia Q, and then put orbs on the ground with Q, and then R, or, uh, if my reaction times are not that good, or I decide not to, I just Q, and then W or whatever, and then I R, and then I E on the back end, or even just like Q, R, E, um, to guarantee I hit the stun. Or maybe I don't even have time to do that, maybe I literally start the fight with R, then E, then Q. So, again, I have to keep in mind, if I R, E, I'm going to have less damage, but it's the, so it's a trade-off. Reliability of hitting the stun versus damage. Um, just to keep in mind. So again, when you're doing these skirmishes, you'd always think, how could I have played it? Should I R first? Should I Q first? Should I, what, what should I do first? Depending on what the trade-off is in the situation. I decided to R the E to guarantee they hit the stun. That was just the way I interpreted the situation. So I have to stay here a little bit. I get my blue buff off that Aurelia, which is nice. Now I get the wave in. Yeah, I just get the wave in. What happens here? Oh, my support keeps roaming. What a nice guy, honestly. This guy goes and he flashes and then he ends up, their team end up killing him. I come back mid, beautiful, whatever. I get a plate. Again, I am willing to sacrifice tempo for a little bit of pl like plate gold. I usually don't do that on champions that want to roam. But because, again, I want gold and I'm a champion that can utilize gold very, very well. Um... I decide to overstay for plates and sacrifice a bit of tempo. Now, gold-wise, I finished my GLP and I've still got 1,204 gold. So look at this. I have two options, really. I can actually um, go... I can wait for my spell for a bit, a needlessly large rod, wait like 30, 40 gold, get a needlessly large rod, or I can literally straight up go um, 
Fiendish Codex. And again, this is the perfect uh, like game for Fiendish Codex. It just feels super, super nice. Because again, in this game, I think Zonius is quite quite nice. Once I get Zonius this game, I feel like no one can really do anything to me. So I was very happy to sit on Fiendish Codex, get into Spellwinder after, and then um, decide whether I want to turn it into a Zonius or a Banshees or whatever. Which was very, very nice. So coming back to lane here, I'm very, very strong. And look at the CS. Uh, Kale has 59 CS. I have 114 at 11 minutes 50 here. I'm absolutely popping off right now. Um, in a very, very... Look at this. After this wave, nearly nearly on the 100 CS. Well, 118 by um, 11 minutes 56. Like, that's really, really good. I'm super, super strong, man. And this is what, I, this is what I've realized. Playing Syndra like this, I have insane CS numbers. Um, because I have so much freedom to CS. A lot of champions can't do this because they don't have the strength in the lane to guarantee that they get tempo bases, efficient bases, um, even guarantee that they can get the farm itself because they get zoned sometimes. Syndra is one of those champions that can literally guarantee it nearly, which is, yeah, just super rare. So coming back to lane here, I don't know what Kale's doing here, so I'm just chilling. Now, another little thing I'm doing here... I'm actually putting orbs out on the ground. Once I got blue, when, when I get blue buff, I like to just spam Q on the ground. I'm not trying to push because I'm just trying to slow build waves because slow building waves on Syndra is much better than just doing one wave because when you slow build, I can just poke under tower and it gives me more, more room to do things, more room to get vision or whatever. It makes me harder to gank when I have a bigger wave. But when I just put the Qs down like this, like over here, then it's great for two reasons. It's great for the fact that um, it's going to generate more threat with my E, so they have to respect my E a lot more. But more importantly, there's more orbs on the ground, so when if I do go for an all-in, I can press R and I'm going to do a lot more damage. So it's like, if I have mana, I might as well use Qs. Like, I'm not going to... Like, that's what you just might as well do. You're not really losing anything. So I'm just spamming Qs. And now, like, I'm just spamming Q, even though it's unlikely that I'll hit them. Um, whereas before, notice how I was very, very careful on when I use Q, but now I'm, like, very blase. I'm just using them all the time. Which, a bad habit because of this, some people, this happens to some people, is that the later in the game that goes, the more blase or, like, what's the mindset? Very, like, chill mindset they have with Q. They actually hit Q less because they're not focusing as much on it. Whereas you still should be focusing on hitting Qs. Like, it's still very important. So I do another little, nice little trade here. Um, now how much damage my Q does. I do so much damage. It's ridiculous. So I'm getting very, very greedy now. I'm trying to get I'm trying to get the three plates. So what I like to do with Syndra is a bit of lane kingdom. If I can get the first three plates, like this first three plates here by myself, I can try and get my jungler to rift held with my mid control. And then we can go mid, break mid, break these last two plates, and then it's just GG. So um if you can get three plates on your own, then that's really, really good. So anyway, Aurelia comes from the side here, uh, which was uh, not good for me. And I kind of get juked and I die. I kind of get locked in by my jungler here. So I want to break this down a bit here. Because so I was super confused in the in the moment. Why I was confused was I thought that because my team was on dragon doing dragon, I thought their jungler would be trading sides of the map doing rift or looking to gank top. I didn't expect to get ganked mid as my team was in river here. So I was really caught off guard mentally. I was like, this doesn't make sense to me, but all right, whatever. So I got ganked. I was tunneling on the plate, so I had to react straight away. I'm like, oh, okay. Goes on me, and because I knew that Aurelia was already on me by the time, like, I didn't have, I, I didn't use E, so I knew she was, like, I didn't have time to use E, sorry, I thought she would already get on me. I was thinking, alright, cool. I should flash out, then RE to get out of this situation. Then we'll, look what happened. I flash, and then I'm like, wait, I'm all good, I can run out, right? I thought I could just run out, I didn't even need to waste my R, because I didn't want to use my R, because the KO was coming down, and I want to keep my R for threat in lane. Then what happens is that... I get trapped here. I miss my GLP. This Aurelia does a really nice like Q onto a minion that I didn't even see. So she Qs onto this minion to dodge my GLP, uh, which was super annoying. And then the KO comes down. I'm trapped. I can't get out. I would have I would have survived here if the ult didn't come out. Um, and we trade one for one, actually two for one, which is really really bad. And I give a shut down to KO. She gets a double kill, which I'm completely fine. I know this KO is not going to be able to do anything this game, but um, it just shows like. Skirmish optimization on Syndra is very important, and skirmishing in general on, on Syndra is like such a high skill cap. Like, there's, there's so many ways to use your abilities, there's so many, way, many ways to optimize your damage and, and do things like that. Um, 
Yeah, so many review. Actually, one thing I didn't cover, guys, just quickly, just going back here. When I got back to lane after getting my GLP, what I actually want to do in this moment, what I'm always thinking about is where the next wave is. So if the next wave is no wave here, I can actually walk up here, use my GLP, and go for a big combo. For some reason in my brain when I came back to lane here, I was in this position, like I was ready to use my GLP, but Kale wasn't showing for so long. I was like, okay, by the time she comes, the next wave is going to be here. So what I should have been doing, I was expecting her to come here much earlier. Like if she's in the open here and there's no wave, I can walk up and just GLP and then get a full combo because she can't dodge it. But I thought the next wave was closer, so I didn't use GLP for some reason. Um, bad play. So this whole time, I could have used my GLP and got a really, really good combo there. So the whole time, I wasted my op that was a wasted opportunity. So I come back. Um, I try to defend bot tower here. They trap me as soon as I come back, but I get a stun into GLP, and I get a nice kill here. Just shows how strong I am. Like, I'm just so ridiculously strong. No one can contest me. So, that happens. Now, ideally, I want to swap lane assignments. So, I want to get out of the side lane. I don't want to be in the side lane. So, the first thing I say here, I say on my way mid, because I don't want to be bot. Remember, side laning on Aurelia, on, on Syndra is really, really not good. So, I, I, I come mid instantly. Missy the Ophelia Assault, whatever. I come back mid. This is really not good because we're sharing CS, but I say go bot. I ping him to go bot. So I believe I... Uh, maybe... I think I use my GLP soon to get a really nice trade. I can't remember though. But the pace of this game is going super good. 140 CS by 14 minutes 30. Beautiful. I see a skirmish breakout, so I want to go to that skirmish ASAP. Now, when I'm going to this, these fights, what I'm thinking about, I'm always thinking about, can I get flanked? Where do I need to, like, how's the fight going to pan out? So, because what I'm thinking is, either one or two things is going to happen. I walk into River here, we don't 100 to 0, because Mordecai is getting to this fight first. Oh, sorry, they have a man advantage, because, sorry, Aurelia and Mordecai is here, my jungler's on bot side. Because I don't want to put myself in a position where I'm getting flanked or pincered or... We don't play the fight fast. Because what happens, if I'm stuck here, Mordecai's is here, Aurelia's here, Kale's here, I don't know where to put my orbs. I don't know whether to peel Mordecai's, are, I don't know whether to help Riven, I don't know whether to turn back onto Kale. So I'm always thinking, I've got to be very careful walking into River here, because I, I need to make sure my back is against the wall, so or at least try and put them in a way where I know that it's... Like, I can get max value out of my orbs and get max value out of my stun. So when I'm walking, I'm like, all right, I got to be a bit careful. So Kale was kind of scared. So I'm, see how I'm hesitating? I'm not running in straight away. So unfortunately, my Riven's in a really bad spot. But then I see Aurelia kind of move out here. So I'm like, all right, I think I think it's all good. I see Kale's pretty far away, so I think I'm all good. Um, and Mordecai's just kind of trapped in the pit. So what happens here... Notice how I'm very cautious with my pathing. I'm not running straight in there because Mordekaiser could be here, pull me in. I'm always trying to find a way to keep my distance. I'm always trying to find a way to just keep myself safe, like protect yourself at all times. Then I see Aurelia up here, so I know 100% that the only way where they can be is uh, Kale's super far away. Now, I can trap this Mordekaiser, um, put him directly in front of me, and then I can get a really nice trade-off. So look at this. Q, wait for it to him to come, start the fight with my GLP, slow to kite, Beautiful. Get as many orbs on the ground as possible. Then R. Uh, then I can f end it out with a W there as well. So, um, yeah. So, I'm always trying to play the fights very calculated. I'm not rushing in. You start the fight with a GLP. Slow them. Maximize your chances of hitting the uh, the combo with your QE. And uh, it's a very reliable way to do, to do skirmishes. So, I stay in lane to get this next wave, knowing that I really want to get an efficient base. So I quickly spam all my abilities on the wave, go for a quick week, quick recall, sorry. Get my needlessly large rod walk, working towards my spellbinder. I can't talk today, I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, and coming back on the map. Now what happens here? Riven kind of gets caught. <laughs> so I try to get the wave in, I'm using my E aggressively. And notice how there's, there's probably been twice in this entire game where I've used my E on the wave. How interesting is that? It's literally been twice, I think, in the entire game I've used E to wave clear. Because either I'm slow building a wave 
or I don't want to use my E because, again, it, it, gen it ruins my threat so then they can freely CS, or it makes me vulnerable to a gank. So I'm very careful, I'm very calculated with the way I use my E. So I get the wave in, and the reason I'm eing here is because I want to get that wave in ASAP, because they were chasing Riven, so I wanted to punish them and get as much damage on tower as possible. So Q, I'm doing so much damage here. Start the fight with my GLP, then, then R, then E. Look at that. So this one's super interesting. So I actually thought I could 100 to 0 this guy, even though Soraka was here. So I start the fight with GLP. I land, a, I try to land a Q. Then I R, because I knew I couldn't, I couldn't Q E because he would just dash or he would just dodge it. Then I R, and then I E after to guarantee the thing, and then I and then I Q on the back end. I nearly kill this Aurelia, even though Soraka was healing the whole time. So uh, I'm doing a, a lot of damage. I think I was just getting a bit cocky there. Uh, to be honest, I should have um, I shouldn't have used my ult because now my threat's really low. And Talia, I believe, is taking blue. Took blue again, so I haven't got a single blue this entire game, which is incredibly unfortunate. I think the only blue I've had this game was from killing Aurelia. So, chuck a ward on one side, give myself a side to lean to. I'm really trying to break this mid tower, but Kale's doing a good job at thinning the wave, and especially now that I don't, I don't have ult, I don't have my GLP up at the moment, I have to respect a little bit. And now my mana's rough. So this is, uh, again, a big downside of not having blue. But I knew this jungle was auto-filled, he's a mid lane main, so I didn't really say anything. I was like, oh, whatever, he's a jungle main. He's a mid main, sorry. Give him the benefit of the doubt. So I'm trying to hold my E till they're closer to generate the, to um, set up a stun. So look at this. This whole time, right? My t I see my my support looking to posture. I'm seeing my top laner here. I know my team is in the area, but they're not in they're not in range to follow up. So a big mistake I see is Syndra's like they use their QE and no one's there to follow up. Like yeah, cool, you got good damage, but like they're not in range. So what I'm trying to do is wait. Put orbs on the ground. I'm not rushing out to use my E. I'm waiting for people to get into position, then I E. Ideally, I actually sh should be putting or more orbs on the ground at the moment to, to increase my chances of hitting the stun. Then I see my Thresh is in the area. He goes in. Then I get a nice stun. We don't really do the combo very well at all, but um, uh, maybe I should... Should I stun first? I think she sh he should just wait for my stun, in my opinion. Because it's so much easier to hit my stun than Q it is for, for Thresh. So the KO ults, and I'm pretty sure Riven just cleans up on the back end anyway, so it's completely fine. But anyway, that happens. Get the wave. Beautiful. I read call because I don't have any mana. I get my spellbinder. Now I'm absolutely popping. This is where I feel so incredibly strong. 179 CS by 18 minutes. I'm absolutely popping. And no, no, this is where the game gets a little awkward when I'm in the side lane. So I don't... What happens? So I've got mid-tier 1. I need to go on the side lane now. I don't. I try not to stay in the side lane unless my jungle is hovering me. So I'm coming to the objective. I want to get to the objective nice and early, just in case the enemy tries to contest. So I try to get here ASAP to control those choke points, but it doesn't look like they're they're contesting at all. And then I go to the side lane here. Now the thing is, I don't like going to the side lane. The only time side lane is good is if I'm really far ahead um, and my jungle is hovering me, and I have I, and I have vision of the enemy jungler. Or, what I like to do is just push and move back to mid. But because we already got the mid objective, we already know that um, mid tower's gone and their jungler's top side and killed my top laner. We can't contest Rift Herald at the moment. I'm just going to go bot and side lane for a while, knowing I'm in an isolated 1v1. So, look what I do. Start the fight with GLP. Guarantees me to hit the stun. Beautiful QR full combo. Let's break this down a little bit here. So, coming, this is actually one of the strengths of Syndra coming from out of vision. When you're coming from out of vision, it's really hard for the team to react to your combo. So I GLP, slow, QE, she, he screws, she screws her flash up, then I Q first, then R, with my with my Spellbinder here. So I, notice I Q first here. I Q at the same time, sorry, while she's stunned, and get a full combo with my Spellbinder. Again, no one can survive that. It's just too much threat. Um... Really, really nice stuff. So I get the, get the uh, creeps, go take their blue buff, go back. Now, what happens? This is actually incredibly important in mid game. So I know that just because I have TP and Riven doesn't have TP, I know the next fight is going to be played around this Rift Herald, and I know I need to be at the fight first. Just because you have TP doesn't mean you should split. Just because you have TP running doesn't mean you should split push. So I know that I need to be going, I'm just drawing the minimap here, I know I need to be on top side for this Rift Herald fight, 
and I know and I know that I need the jungle to hover me. If I go bot, I know my Talia has to be topside because we need to play for Rift Herald. Or Baron coming up in 30 seconds. If I'm bot, my, I know my jungle is going to be topside. This is our next objective as well. We've already got bot tier 1. We've already got mid tier 1. This is our next objective. I know that jungle won't be able to hover me if I go bot, even if I have TP. So I'm t I, I tell my team, I tell Riven, I said, you should go bot, even though you don't have TP. Um, because I'm the strong point. I'm the carry. I don't care about you and what you, like, get, if you get behind in CS. I don't care. We can win the fight 4v5 anyway, because I'm so strong. Even if you can't TP to the fight, I just want you to push and move. I don't need you to split push either. Um, we can hold off any objective regardless. And yes, there is an argument to say, yeah, you should match KO bot and TP to the fight, but... I don't want to TP to anything, and I know. And who's to say that Aurelia just doesn't leave bot topside and um, hovers Kale, and then I just die in the side lane? I don't want to be stuck bot isolated one v one or two v one versus their jungle mid. So this is another thing I like to do is like in the side lane, I like to kind of loop around people, get some picks off, GLP first into full combo, Mordekaiser. So I thought my QE actually, the damage actually got off. So I was expecting Mordekaiser to be no HP, but he was still full HP and he survives. I was so confused here. I was like, oh my God, I, I, I didn't, I didn't feel like I needed to ult. Like I greeted holding onto my ult. Not good. Generally not what you want to do. Don't hold onto your ult to be, you know, save it. Like if you, you, if you get and get, if you can get a kill with it, get a kill. So... Another fight, little, little fight kind of breaks out here. But I know my team's hovering me, so I'm pretty safe to be in the side lane. I tell Riven to go bots. Um, this means we have a lot of top control. My jungle's on the top side here, so I feel very, very safe to use my E aggressively on the wave. Beautiful. And then we actually start Baron, because Kale's bot with no TP. And we pick their bot lane. So we end up just doing this Baron, fast forwarding things a little bit. Beautiful. And worst case scenario, they come here. I can just turn with my GLP and my full combo. I don't mind being on objectives first, as long as I'm not coming into the fight late. So I get the wave, get my, my uh, Zonyas, come back. Now I've got my Zonyas as well. Now, this was a game I was thinking in hindsight. I probably actually should have got Morellos because they had Soraka and Kale. But in the game, I was like, thinking, screw it. I just want AP. My AD has a uh, average... What is it called? The, the blade thing that does healing reduction and my um jungler has morellos as well we have plenty of healing reduction uh anyway so whatever so anyway rounding out this game what happens here nice combo trying to hit q then kale r's taking kind of taking a lot of tower damage here Nothing too special going on. Actually, what happens in this fight? Let's see how I navigate these fights. Dodgers might... Uh... Hmm. How do I play this? What happened to my GLP? When do I use my GLP? I'll use it here to hit the, the combo. Okay. So what happens here? So I walk up. Aurelia's on my supports. I miss my QE. <sighs> Ah, uh, this is a perfect example of what I was saying before. Like, this is... Versing these dash champions, you just know to R. You just got to R first, RE. You can't afford to QE. Because if I miss my QE like this, if I QE and miss, like, I feel so weak after... Like, it's so hard for me to hit any of my abilities after I miss my stun. Like, I feel like... It feels bad sometimes to start the fight with R, like, especially on one target. But if it's a kill, it's a kill. Like, we kill this guy. We can rinse through the rest of the team anyway. Don't hold on to it. You don't need to greed. Like, unless I knew he didn't have dash, but I didn't have that information. And I kind of greeted here. So, Mordekaiser goes on me. I peel back. Try to pop my phase rush there to dodge abilities. Come back, get my stun. Pretty funny. Really not much Mordekaiser can do to me. One other thing as well, um, I'm always trying to get orbs out whenever I can, even if like there, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hit it. Like a lot of the time I'm not going to hit it, but just having orbs out on the ground just for threat, it is in something important to think about. So I come back, TP. Oh yeah, oh, I miss, I keep missing my stuns. That's one thing I'm not good at on Syndra. I'm not good at knowing the max range with the QE. That's something I probably need to go into practice tool with because... Like, it is important. And when I miss my stun, at this point in time, it's not too bad because the cooldown's so low. But, like, earlier on in the game, I did miss one. And it's a pretty big deal. 
get a nice combo off as well. Notice this whole time, why this is good for me, is like they're all in one area. No one's coming from a flank. No one's coming in from a side. I know I'm completely fine to use my E aggressively. I don't need to worry. Whenever people are coming into me like this, I'm always trying to keep them out of range, um, play around my E cooldown. When my E's down, I play a little bit more respectfully. It's much better than... Like, I'm always thinking about who's threatening. Who's... Who can possibly get onto me? You've got to have good threat assessment in Syndra, otherwise you're going to have a bad time. You're going to have a really bad time. So, anyway, we slowly choked them out of this game. Nothing too special happens. I think we, we get those inhibs. We deny camps. Um, come back out on the map. Continually getting more farm. Okay, oh, this is a perfect example. So, Aurelia goes onto me here. Look, look how I use E. I E that. And then I RQ. So I thought that was the better way to do it. So it's actually it's actually interesting because this was what I was talking about before. So I GLP try to get a combo, but I was trying to keep my range, jump, E, and then and then I use that. So one thing one I didn't do here, if I if I Q no if I E and then Q R with my spellbinder and then W, I think he dies. But to be honest, I wasn't expecting it all and I forgot about my spellbinder. So I'm still again not the best at using spellbinder. Um, but I think this is the combo that you should do versus a lot, lot of dash champions instead of just holding your, um, instead of like RE because then they're on top of you and it can be a little bit awkward. So I think that's a good example of kind of showing you the different way of using the combo as well. So anyway, shove it out. Beautiful. Take their red, go to Baron again, nothing too special. And then we push down mid for the, no, it's push down top. Sorry. Again, keeping them at range, constantly assessing who's flanking. Um, putting as many orbs on the ground as possible to generate threat. If they get in range, I'll use a you know, long-range stun. But because my stun is such a short cooldown at this point in the game, I'm completely fine with using it very casually. Um, I'm waiting for someone to just, you know, disrespect, in which I'm going to start my fight with GLP, go for a full combo with my Spellbinder. So, Mordekaiser goes for an ult on my AD, so I'm trying to play for self-peel, front to back. Caitlyn's out of position. Get a full combo, dead, go next, QE, one shot, next. Pretty standard stuff here, guys. And I know, if you, you know, nothing too special here, but I think it was good to kind of show the game how it ended out. So, I was hoping um, with this VOD, you can kind of see a very different approach to playing Syndra. It's very, much slower, isn't it? It's very slow, much slower, less chaotic, not worried about scale, getting out scaled and things like that. 280 CS by 29 minutes. Very, very good CS. Um, and this is, again, this is just my one approach. It's given me a lot of success in solo queue. Give it a go. Um, and you'll notice that Syndra is a very mechanically high, it's very mechanically intensive, high skill cap champion. Um, take your time. If you have any questions about anything in this video, um, feel free to hit me up in the comments below or in the Discord. And keep in mind, guys, that... Um, Syndra is a long-term project. Don't expect to pick 10, play 10 games of it and be amazing at it. I played a lot of this champion and it took me a long time to be comfortable. So only recently, after spamming another probably 20 games, like I didn't, I wasn't comfortable on it, honestly. It really took me a while just to click with it. And it was all about feeling my, my damage output, knowing all the small little micro details that, and knowing how to play the lanes um, kind of opened it up for me. So give me, and I'd love to hear your results, guys, trying out this style. So in the ranked achievement section of my Discord, I'd love to see you guys trying out this style and how much success you've been, you have with it. And, or maybe it's just hogwash and you lose more games. Uh, either way, just let me know, guys. And cheers. Uh, thanks for the support.